next one, but to introduce it, uh, really the intent of this one was at Bonneville Dam, we have an operation at Washington Shore where we have reduced nighttime flows at the fishway entrances. And that was based on some information collected by U of I early on, and we showed a slight benefit to adult Pacific lamprey entrance efficiency. So the thought was, well, we should apply this everywhere. And we didn't want to do that until we had some site-specific information to go off of. And part of this next presentation is looking at Bradford Island B Branch and Powerhouse One, looking at those reduced nighttime flows to see if it'd be a benefit to implement that permanently. And then at the end, you'll talk a little bit about the new Washington Shore LPS ramps and some on it interactions and lamprey use. So with that, we'll let Matt get started. Yeah, so as Ricardo said here, this talk is more specific about behaviors to a couple of things that were uh, changed both operationally and structurally at Bonneville Dam uh, with the intent to benefit lamprey passage. Uh, it's the same group of folks that I acknowledged the first time, but I especially want to thank the uh, folks at Bonneville and the Dallas Dams who coordinated the nighttime velocity experiment. Uh, it takes a lot of coordination to uh, change the plumbing day after day, and these guys did a great job, as you'll see, the, uh, the experiment came off well. So there's going to be two really primary objectives here for the second presentation. The first one is to talk about the nighttime uh, velocity or head reduction inside the adult fishways, which is uh, aimed to improve lamprey egress inside the fishways. This took place at six locations in total at two dams. The uh, Bonneville B branch is the photo on the left there. It's dewatered in this case. The spillway is just to the left of the wall. This is a site where lamprey have traditionally had some problem passing, passing Bonneville. The experiment at Bonneville also affected the two primary entrances at the Powerhouse One fishway. There's an entrance, a large entrance at both ends of the, of the fishway. And then up at the Dallas, three entrance locations were affected by the experiment. What we can see here is the east fishway at the corner. There's a large, large entrance in the corner right here. There's another entrance out at the west end of the powerhouse. And then a third entrance to this fishway is adjacent to the spillway, the south spillway entrance. So that's where the experiment's affected. The second objective of the talk, I'll give us a few slides at the end, are to talk about uh, how Lampa were behaving near this new LPS structure. It's the UMTJ LPS. For those of you who want to know what that acronym stands for, there it is. This is a dual lamp structure that's at the top of the Washington Shore ladder. The picture here is looking downstream, so the upstream migrant tunnel comes in from the left. The traditional fishway comes in uh, from the right, and this lamprey passage structure is located just upstream from that and downstream from the count station. So that is a new structure. All right, so the, the velocity experiment, um, as Ricardo said, this was effective in a previous set of experiments in 2007 to 2009. It's being considered for implementation at a number of other locations. Here's one of the take home figures from the uh, the 2007 to 2009 study. I just want to spend a minute on this. The y-axis here is entrance efficiency, so how many lamprey were getting inside the fishway at the south and north ends of Powerhouse 2. The reduced nighttime velocity is the gray bars. Normal operation is the hashed bar. And then over at Powerhouse 2, they had a standby operation where velocity was essentially zero as they floated trash off the trash racks. And what we learned in this experiment is that, in fact, if you turn down the velocity, reduce the head, more lamprey make it inside the fishway. So that reduced one of the bottlenecks uh, for lamprey passage at the project. However, the, so the overall effects on dam passes were somewhat equivocal uh, because, as I saw, as I showed in the last presentation, a lot of fish make it inside the fishway, but they still turn around somewhere upstream at those difficult passage areas, primarily the serpentine weirs and the transition area. So the, the experiment, the first experiment was effective, um, but not, not a slam dunk in terms of improving passage at the dam. In 2018, we, wanted, we followed a sort of similar overall protocol as that first experiment, but in this case, at the Bradford Island fishways. I put this figure in just to show, these graphs show uh, basically uh, attrition or survival curves, if you want, as fish move through the three primary routes at Bradford Island. The thing I want you to take away from the figure is that at the B branch in particular, uh, fish would get inside that fishway and then immediately turn around and go back into the tail race. So that's been a difficult passage spot at Bradford Island. 
In contrast, this powerhouse one north and powerhouse south, one south, had relatively good rates of passage, although still only half the fish that entered at those locations passed the dam. That's some context there. At the Dalles, uh, lamprey, adult lamprey, do pass through the fishways more efficiently and more effectively than at Bonneville Dam. So the baseline estimates to keep in mind there are between about 45 and 70 percent for the east fishway. All right, so our, our experiment here in 2018 was a randomized block design. It ran from June 1st to August 31st. The reduced treatment within block ran from about 10 at night to 4 in the morning. And here is a sort of a summary of what the, the head differentials look like. This was from some uh, level riders that we deployed inside and outside of the Powerhouse 1 North entrance. You can see there were a couple of preseason tests to make sure that the plumbing was working as expected, and then the experiment started June 1st. The reduced treatment had a head differential down here about uh, 0.2 meters, and then the normal operations more like 0.5, 0.4. And you can see that the, uh, the treatments alternated back and forth randomly throughout that whole period. So the, as I said, the core did a great job of making that experiment work. We evaluated the effects with only the radio telemetry group. This is one of the primary reasons we radio tagged fish in 2018. The passage metrics I'll be talking about are entrance, fishway, and dam passage efficiency, and I'll describe those when I get there. This just shows the monitoring effort at Bradford Island. Uh, there were radio antennas at the three primary openings, these two at the ends of the, of the powerhouse, and then over here at the, at the B branch opening. The circles are underwater uh, antennas. And this is a setup uh, very similar to what we used in the past, so we can compare to previous results as well. Just want to briefly say how the plumbing works. These are the locations where the fish valves are. They essentially control how much water is pumped through the diffusers in the lower sections of these fishways, including in the Powerhouse 1 collection channel. Importantly, there was no change in the velocity or the volume of water in the upper section of the fishway. And that will be important as you, as you see some of the results. This is just a quick look at the monitoring effort at the Dallas Dam. Again, there were the three entrances, the south, the west, and the east. We had uh, radio antennas at all these locations, some pit readers, and then an antenna at the top of the fishway as well. A little different mechanism for controlling head here. They were controlled um, by raising and lowering the entrance weirs to change the head differential. OK, so here are some of the first uh, radio planetary results. The graphic shows um, powerhouse one south. This is the number of times lamprey approached that opening and the number of times they entered for sort of a baseline efficiency of around 0.39. This is with both treatments combined. And again, the treatment, the experimental period is from June 1st to August 31st. So I'll only be talking about the data that occurred during the experiment. Here are the two other Bradford Island uh, sets of data. You can see there are fewer fish overall that were using Powerhouse 1 North. And then there was a lot of action over at the B branch. And we've seen this in past years as well. So 730 approaches there, 151 entrances. Also notice that there are pretty notable differences here in uh, overall entrance efficiency with the treatments combined. So the take home here is fish are doing different things at different locations, um, and the, the outcomes are different. So what was the effect of the experiment? The first metric here is an event-based entrance efficiency estimate. Basically, it answers the question, was a fishway approach followed by a fishway entry? An individual fish in this metric could have more than one approach or entry event. So that's why we call it event-based. And here are the results for the Bradford fishway. The blue is entrance efficiency uh, for the reduced treatment, black for, for the normal treatment. And really here, this is an across-the-board improvement in getting lamprey inside the Bradford Island fishway. In a couple cases, more than doubling the, uh, the rate of entry at this, at this um, site. That's good. A good result. I do also want to mention that we had to exclude a few events. Uh, some fish would arrive at the opening just as the transition between treatments was happening. So we excluded some of those fish. Um, but it was a, a relatively small number. And I'll talk about how we'll handle those fish in our final analysis in a moment. The second metric uh, asked the question of, was a fishway entry followed by passage of the dam via the Bradford Island fishway? We call this fishway passage efficiency. The answer is uh, no. 
So much like we saw in 2007 to 2009, the treatment that a fish entered the fishway during did not have any effect on whether the fish ultimately passed the project. So you can see these numbers are remarkably similar between the two treatments. And again, that's because there was maybe no real change in conditions upstream from the openings. And then the final metric I want to talk about this morning is uh, dam passage efficiency for unique fish. Because of course, ultimately, we care about whether individuals pass, not necessarily whether they pass on any specific attempt. So this metric is, asks, answers the question, was dam passage associated with the treatment or treatments that a fish encountered at their fishway approach? So there's three categories here. Fish could be exposed to two different treatments while they were at Bradford Island, normal only or reduced only. And there's clearly an effect here. Um, there's a smaller number of fish that were encountered only reduced treatment. That's because it only occurred for six hours a night on uh, not every night. But there's an almost 20% increase there in, uh, in entrance efficiency. Dam, I'm sorry, dam passage efficiency. So this is a very promising result that we'll uh, explore more rigorously, but it is a good indicator. All right, so moving up to the DALs, uh, the same figure as what I showed before. And really, the, some of the same take home messages. There's big differences in the activity levels at the three locations at the DALs. And then also uh, notice there's a three-fold difference here in, in sort of a baseline entrance efficiency with that west powerhouse site having low entrance efficiency. And also very few lamprey detected um, at the south spillway opening. This is consistent also with what we've seen in the past. All right, so moving into the experimental results, uh, this is, slide should be familiar. Reduced treatment in blue, entrance efficiency is the metric. And we see at the DALs at both the east and west openings, uh, significant improvement in entrance efficiency. No real difference here at the south entrance, but uh, very little activity at that site. So in total, a pretty strong effect of improved entrance efficiency at the Dallas. These are the two other metrics. There were no st statistically significant results at these uh, in these two metrics. The one on the right is was an entry followed by dam passage, really no difference there. And then here's that unique fish metric. Again, this is in the right direction. Uh, fish that encountered only reduced velocity uh, were more likely to pass the dam. All right, so our preliminary conclusions from these experiments was that uh, the reduced nighttime velocity certainly appeared to significantly improve lamprey egress into the fishways, so that was effective. There was some evidence, particularly at Bonneville Dam, that the reduced treatment was associated with more dam passages via the Bradford Island Fishway, so that's encouraging. But I want to emphasize that the experiment is complex and the behaviors are somewhat complex. We have a number of additional metrics that we have traditionally looked at. Um, I'll be, we'll be reporting those this spring, a few examples of what those metrics are. And then we also uh, intend to use a Cox proportional hazard regression model, which will handle that treatment switching, which is a big challenge with these block designs. Um, that will uh, help us uh, with our confidence about the uh, entrance efficiency and passage efficiency results. So that's what's coming. All right, the last few slides here are about lamprey behavior over by the new LPS structure. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this is downstream from the count window on Washington shore. The UMT junction is just downstream. This system uh, was built a couple years ago, and it is integrated with the existing AWS, which is Auxiliary Water Supply LPS system. So that's been running for several years, very effective at passing lamprey around the serpentine weir sections, which are over here. Um, so the new structure feeds lamprey into the old structure. In 2017, we took a first look at this uh, location. We used Didson to see how whether salmon or steelhead were attracted to the ramp. This is a Didson snapshot. Um, the ramp was right there. We also looked at lamprey behaviors there. What we saw was that all species, there was a lot of activity near the ramps, but there was no evidence that either salmon, salmon is, or lamprey were delaying or getting held up by the two ramps. Fish were moving up and down past these structures uh, at very high rates. And the, the graphic on the bottom just shows how long lamprey were spending passing the ramps. The scale here is in seconds. So upstream moving fish would pass the ramps in three or four seconds typically. Downstream moving fish just quickly move past the structure. What we can't tell, of course, from passive monitoring like Didson was 
what individuals do, whether they spend a lot of time moving up and downstream, whether they are delayed in any way. So that was one of the motivations for the, uh, for the tagging study in this year and next year. This is uh, uh, our extensive monitoring array at the Washington Shore Fishway. The study area I'll be talking about is from the junction of the UMT channel, which is coming up here, the traditional or up overflow weir section of the ladder. The new LPS structure is right here. The old LPS structure is inside the auxiliary water supply channel. Here are the serpentine weirs, and then all those systems feed up to the top of the ladder. The blue symbols here are radio antennas. The, uh, the red symbols are where we had one or more half duplex pit antennas. And then these purple spots are the new uh, uh, PSMFC sites that are inside the serpentine weir uh, section. That is very useful for monitoring lamprey behavior in that section. Inside the structures themselves, we also had a number of antennas. So we were really wired up. We could tell when fish came up either of the new ramps as they moved through the rest boxes. And then it and when it joined up with the existing LPS, there were sites upstream from that junction at the top of the LPS uh, combination and then at the exit from the fishway. So very well wired. And this is an example of the kind of behavior we saw by fish that used the new structure. From downstream to upstream, here's uh, time on the x-axis. Here's where the antennas were on the y-axis. So fish came up through the UMT junction, swam right past the new ramp, and entered the serpentine weir section, where it then spent almost a full week moving up and down inside those vertical slots. Um, this fish did not get detected anywhere downstream until it moved down and entered the UMTJ and quickly passed the dam. This was very typical of all fish that used the, bi or used the new structure. This individual spent almost a week in the study area upstream from the UMT, and it ultimately passed through that structure in just one hour. Here's a couple other examples just showing the similar behaviors. Um, the two on the left, the fish would move up into the serpentine weir sections, come back all the way down to the UMT junction, up again, back and forth. So that behavior occurred at a number of fish as well. In each case, though, they ultimately came down and used the UMTJ and quickly passed, the, passed over the dam. That's what the data looked like. Um, in terms of evaluating how the overall effectiveness of the new structure was, there were 240 pit tag fish that reached the study area there at the junction. Of those, 6% ultimately passed through the new structure and passed the dam. About a third of the fish passed using the old LPS structure inside the auxiliary water supply channel. Almost exactly the same number passed through the serpentine weir section. So those two numbers are equivalent, showing the importance of the LPSs to getting lamprey past the project. A handful of fish was recaptured at the traps, and we released those upstream near Stevenson. All those numbers together, we still had a, about a quarter of the fish that reached the top of the fishway but did not pass Bonneville Dam. And the fish that were up in there uh, that passed the dam spent quite a bit of time in the study area. The, X, or the axis here is passage time in days from their first detection at the UMT junction till they passed the dam. You can see some fish were there for three weeks. A number of fish were there for a week or more. The blue dots here are the fish that use the UMTJ. So a typical fish spent two or three days in the upper section of the fishway before passing the dam. Passage through the new structure itself was very rapid. However, most fish passed that in less than an hour. So the, the new structure appeared to be effective if fish can find it. We'll go through a similar quick summary here for the radio tag group. There were 199 fish that reached that section of the fishway. 4% used the new structure. About 21% used the existing or the old LPS. And then an interesting difference here is twice as many passed through the serpentine weirs as passed through the LPS. And we attribute that in part to the radio tag fish being larger. They appear to be more willing, perhaps, to try to move through the ladder. Uh, there also may be some effect of having a radio. Uh, we'll try to tease some of that out. Um, but there is definitely a, a morphological difference between the two sample groups. Among the RC fish, a third that reached this part of the Washington Shore Fishway didn't pass the dam. So lower success despite being a larger bodied. And I attribute that in part to more of the fish being up here in the serpentine weir section, where failure rates are high. Again, just passage times. Typical fish pass through, uh, the radiotype fish pass through in about a day on median. 
So the conclusions for the for the new structure, uh, definitely Lamper are using it, and I'm sure Nathan, Nathan's going to talk some more about the details of that. Uh, from the tag groups of about four to six percent use the new structure. That uh, that uh, equates to six to eight percent of the fish that passed via the Washington Shore Fishway. So that's um, quite a bit of use. Almost all of the fish that used it, however, first moved up past the structures. And we attribute that uh, to probably pretty low attraction to these ramps. The section of the fishway where the ramps are has pretty laminar flow. There's no special attraction. There's no cul-de-sac or dead end here, which is typically associated with LPS structures. Uh, so the fish are just swimming past, just as we saw in the Didson study. So the results from this new structure are encouraging. There is use, um, but as evidenced by that 25 to 30 percent that are still failing to pass, this section of the Bonneville Fishway remains a critical uh, passage bottleneck. And that's what we have so far. I'm happy to take any questions. I was just wondering if you had any um, any issues or concerns with the Salmonid passage with changing your operations in the in the fishways at night. Oh, at night. Um, so what we've learned in the radio telemetry studies of, of Salmonids over the years is uh, a large majority pass during daylight or um, from dawn to dusk. Uh, so we think it's a fairly limited impact on adults, but it's probably non-zero. Uh, some fish are certainly in the fishways at night. Um, I can't recall whether we looked specifically at that in that earlier study, if there was any effect on, on adult salmonids, but uh, my sense is that if there is, it's pretty limited. Nathan. Hi, Matt. Uh, thank you so much for doing this very thorough study. I, I know how much work that uh, people put in out there, because I saw them out there every day working it hard. Um, the resolution that you have, especially in that Washington Fishway, is, is the best I've seen so far. So yeah, it's by lot. far better than we've ever had before. Since it's so good, another question, of course, comes to mind. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of a two-part question. I guess the overarching question is, are you seeing evidence of recycling of fish? So fish that are using the LPSs, dropping back into the fishway, and then coming back down through the count slot? Yes. Uh, we did see a couple examples where fish went through the existing LPS structure in the AWS channel. Those fish drop currently into the upper section of the ladder upstream from the serpentine weirs. Um, a couple of those fish did move back downstream and got detected in the serpentine weir section. Um, I ha we haven't looked at it thoroughly, but uh, when I was going through individual examples, um, I did see a couple. My guess is that it's less than 5%, but it's one of the things we'll be looking at uh, this year. We haven't really been able to tell in the past. With those new pit antennas inside the serpentine weir, we'll really have a much better resolution on that question. A kind of a similar question, but just for fish that are using the UMTJ, one of the concerns I have is that as they drop into the old LPS, that rather than continue up and out the exit, they could also go backwards. I mean, there's some fiking in there to prevent that, but it's yeah. not perfect. So um, as I said, we saw a fish, uh, let's see, I think it was about 23 or 25 fish in total that used the UMTJ LPS. None of those fish fell back through the AWS LPS. They all proceeded upstream through the entire structure. That's what I like to hear. Thanks. Yeah, so that's that's encouraging. Small sample, but yeah. Okay. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.